you. And this is an idea. What happens when we join them? Something fantastic. Like Pravesh toes that never age, that save our forests, or customizable artifone wardrobes that match your personality and are redefining modern homes. <laughs> Tomorrow is shaped by imagination and steel. This is steel, and this is an idea. So what happens when we join them? Something marvelous. Like cars that are lighter, more fuel efficient, yet safer. Thanks to Hyperform Automotive Steel, which lowers CO2 emission and makes this world a better place. Tomorrow is shaped by imagination and steel. This is steel, and this is an idea. So what happens when we join them? Something iconic. Like the Bandra Worli Sea Link, an engineering marvel that connects two parts of a thriving city, where Tata Steel's state-of-the-art LRPC strands have played a role, inserted in the concrete deck, and anchored to support the vision of new India. Tomorrow is shaped by imagination and steel. This is steel and this is an idea. So what happens when we join them? Something unbelievable, like transforming mobility solutions from world-class metro railway networks to ultra-modern airports, where Tata Steel's LRPC strands and Tata Structura Steel hollow sections have played a role. Now that's what I call a nation on the move. <laughs> huh? Tomorrow shaped by imagination and steel. This is steel and this is an idea. 
सो वॉट हैुप्लीकेट प्लाई ऐसी भर गया है बेफिक्र रही है सर जी आपने लिया है सेंचुरी प्लाई इसके हर बोर्ड पे है क्यू आर कोड स्कैन किया और सच जान लिया This is Tata Steel and this is an idea. So what happens when you join them? Something remarkable like the material of the future. Fiber reinforced polymers that goes beyond steel. That is high on strength and corrosion resistance and is cost effective. A material that will be used in foot over bridges, the insides of railway compartments and electric vehicles as also in infrastructure for smart cities. Tomorrow is shaped by imagination and steel. This is steel and this is an idea. What happens when we join them? Something magnificent. Like the Burj Khalifa, the world's tallest building, three times the height of the Eiffel Tower, an iconic landmark where Tata Steel's Comfloor 80 composite floor decking has played a part, making it a triumph of human inspiration. Tomorrow shaped by imagination and steel. Tata Steel, we also make tomorrow. Welcome to Century Classroom. Century Ply values the trust of its customers, contractors, carpenters and architects and promises to keep it intact. To help you buy original Century Ply every single time, we have introduced Century Promise app. Install Century Promise app on your smartphone, log in and scan the QR code. Get the authenticity of your plywood verified. E warranty certificate can be downloaded instantly on app or can be sent to your registered email ID. If you are a customer, you can ensure your peace of mind by verifying the authenticity of the plywood. Contractors can win over their customers by their transparent approach and by issuing e warranty certificates in the customer's name. Architects can impress their customers and win their trust by issuing e warranty certificates. Century Ply is the only company to use smart technology. Thank you for watching Century Classroom. The steel and this is an idea. What happens when we join them? Something fantastic. Like Pravesh doors that never age, that save our forests, or customizable artifone wardrobes that match your personality and are redefining modern homes. <laughs> <laughs> Tomorrow is shaped by imagination and steel. This is steel and this is an idea. So what happens when we join them? Something marvelous. Like cars that are lighter, more fuel efficient, yet safer. Thanks to Hyperform automotive steel which lowers CO2 emission and makes this world a better place. Tomorrow is shaped by imagination and steel
This is steel and this is an idea. So what happens when we join them? Something iconic. Like the Bandra Valley Sea Link, an engineering marvel that connects two parts of a thriving city, where Tata Steel's state-of-the-art LRPC strands have played a role, inserted in the concrete deck and anchored to support the vision of new India. Tomorrow is shaped by imagination. Steel, and this is an idea. What happens when we join them? Something fantastic. Like Pravesh doors that never age, that save our forests, or customizable artifone wardrobes that match your personality and are redefining modern homes. <laughs> Tomorrow is shaped by imagination and steel. This is steel, and this is an idea. So what happens when we join them? Something marvelous, like cars that are lighter, more fuel efficient, yet safer. Thanks to Hyperform Automotive Steel, which lowers CO2 emission and makes this world a better place. Tomorrow is shaped by imagination and steel. मार्केट डुप्लीकेट प्लाई से भर गया है बेफिक्र रहिए सर जी आपने लिया है सेंचुरी प्लाई इसके हर बोर्ड पे है क्यूआर कोड स्कैन किया और सच जान लिया दिस इज स्टील एंड दिस आइकॉनिक लाइक द बैंड्रा वर्ली सी लिंक एन इंजीनियरिंग मार्वल that connects two parts of a thriving city where Tata Steel's state-of-the-art LRPC strands have played a role, inserted in the concrete deck and anchored to support the vision of new India. Tomorrow is shaped by imagination and steel. This is steel and this is an idea. So what happens when we join them? Something unbelievable, like transforming mobility solutions from world-class metro railway networks to ultra-modern airports, where Tata Steel's LRPC strands and Tata Structura Steel hollow sections have played a role. Now that's what I call a nation on the move. <laughs> huh? Tomorrow shaped by imagination and steel. Welcome to Century Classroom. Century Ply values the trust of its customers, contractors, carpenters and architects and promises to keep it intact. To help you buy original Century Ply every single time, we have introduced Century Promise app. Install Century Promise app on your smartphone, log in and scan the QR code. Get the authenticity of your plywood verified. E-warranty certificate can be downloaded instantly on app or can be sent to your registered email ID. If you are a customer 
You can ensure your peace of mind by verifying the authenticity of the ply board. Contractors can win over their customers by their transparent approach and by issuing e-warranty certificates in the customer's name. Architects can impress their customers and win their trust by issuing e-warranty certificates. Century Ply is the only company to use smart technology. Thank you for watching Century Classroom. This is Tata Steel and this is an idea. So what happens when you join them? Something remarkable, like the material of the future. Fiber reinforced polymers that goes beyond steel, that is high on strength and corrosion resistance and is cost effective. A material that will be used in foot over bridges, the insides of railway compartments and electric vehicles as also an infrastructure for smart cities. Tomorrow is shaped by imagination and steel. This is steel and this is an idea. What happens when we join them? Something magnificent. Like the Burj Khalifa, the world's tallest building, three times the height of the Eiffel Tower, an iconic landmark where Tata Steel's Comfloor 80 composite floor decking has played a part, making it a triumph of human inspiration. Tomorrow shaped by imagination and steel. Tata Steel, we also make tomorrow. is an idea. What happens when we join them? Something fantastic. Like Pravesh doors that never age, that save our forests, or customizable artifone wardrobes that match your personality and are redefining modern homes. <laughs> Tomorrow is shaped by imagination and steel. This is steel and this is an idea. So what happens when we join them? Something marvellous, like cars that are lighter, more fuel efficient, yet safer. Thanks to Hyperform Automotive Steel, which lowers CO2 emission and makes this world a better place. Tomorrow is shaped by imagination and steel. मार्केट डुप्लीकेट प्लाई से भर गया है बेफिक्र रहिए सर जी आपने लिया है सेंचुरी प्लाई इसके हर बोर्ड पे है क्यूआर कोड स्कैन किया और सच जान लिया दिस इज स्टील एंड दिस इज एन आइडिया सो व्हाट हैपेंस व्हेन वी जॉइन देम समथिंग आइकॉनिक लाइक द बैंड्रा वर्ली सीलिंग एन इंजीनियरिंग मार्वल that connects two parts of a thriving city where Tata Steel's state-of-the-art LRPC strands have played a role inserted in the concrete deck and anchored to support the vision of new India. Tomorrow is shaped by imagination and steel. This is steel and this is an idea. So what happens when we join them? 
something unbelievable like transforming mobility solutions from world class metro railway networks to ultra modern airports where tata steel's lrpc strands and tata structura steel hollow sections have played a role now that's what i call a nation on the move <laughs> ha huh? tomorrow shaped by imagination and steel Welcome to Century Classroom. Century Ply values the trust of its customers, contractors, carpenters and architects and promises to keep it intact. To help you buy original Century Ply every single time, we have introduced Century Promise app. Install Century Promise app on your smartphone, log in and scan the QR code. Get the authenticity of your plywood verified. E warranty certificate can be downloaded instantly on app or can be sent to your registered email ID. If you are a customer, you can ensure your peace of mind by verifying the authenticity of the ply board. Contractors can win over their customers by their transparent approach and by issuing e warranty certificates in the customer's name. Architects can impress their customers and win their trust by issuing e warranty certificates. Century Ply is the only company to use smart technology. Thank you for watching Century Classroom. This is Tata Steel and this is an idea. So what happens when you join them? Something remarkable like the material of the future. Fiber reinforced polymers that goes beyond steel that is high on strength and corrosion resistance and is cost effective. A material that will be used in foot over bridges the insides of railway compartments and electric vehicles as also an infrastructure for smart cities tomorrow is shaped by imagination and steel this is steel and this is an idea what happens when we join them something magnificent like the burj khalifa the world's tallest building three times the height of the eiffel tower an iconic landmark where tata steel's comp floor 80 composite floor decking has played a part making it a triumph of human inspiration tomorrow shaped by imagination and steel tata steel we also make tomorrow
idea. What happens when we join them? Something fantastic. Like Praveshtos? That never age. That save our forests. Or customizable artifone wardrobes that match your personality. And are redefining modern homes. <laughs> Tomorrow is shaped by imagination and steel. This is steel. And this is an idea. So what happens when we join them? Something marvelous. Like cars that are lighter, more fuel efficient, yet safer. Thanks to Hyperform Automotive Steel, which lowers CO2 emission and makes this world a better place. Tomorrow is shaped by imagination and steel. मार्केट डुप्लीकेट प्लाई से भर गया है बेफिक्र रहिए सर जी आपने लिया है सेंचुरी प्लाई इसके हर बोर्ड पे है क्यूआर कोड स्कैन किया और सच जान लिया Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Before we start off the session today, just one request. Requesting all of you to please kindly put your mobiles on silent or switched off mode, please. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the fifth edition of our flagship uh, leadership lecture series. In fact, we would recollect, some of you would recollect, we commenced the series in 2017 when we had uh, uh, Dr. Montek Singh Aluwalia address us, followed by Thorov Gang uh, Dr. Shashi Tharoor, Saurav Ganguly, and then we had Dr. R.S. Sodhi. Today's session is about a situation or a condition that the world is going through currently. The current global economic uh, situation possesses certain uncertain elements, and the recent pandemic has called, uh, caused unprecedented humanitarian emergency. All of us have faced with the pandemic and little knowledge and no experience of how to overcome it. The last two years have been specifically difficult for the policymakers as well as business. What we have done to, is uh, learn, we'll have to learn how to cope with uh, such problems and make decisions when no templates are available and no one is really sure what is going to happen in the future. To help us guide through these times and share with us his knowledge of having tried to steer the country through these difficult times, we have amidst us today, ladies and gentlemen, Sri Sanjeev Sanyal, who is currently a member of the Economic Advisory Committee to the Honorable Prime Minister. A Calcutta boy, Mr. Sanyal also represents India on a number of international forums and is also co-chair of the G20 Framework Working Group. He has been one of the main architects of G20's global action plan used to coordinate the global response to COVID-19 pandemic. Prior to joining the government in February 17, he spent over two decades in the financial sector and was global strategist and managing director at Deutsche Bank. He was named Young Global Leader by the World Economic Forum in 2010 and is also a well-known urban theorist and writer. Won't take any much more of your time and would request Mr. Abraham Stefanos, President of the Bengal Chamber, to please commence the session formally with his welcome address. Sir. Good morning. Uh, or rather, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed my pleasure to extend a very warm welcome to all of you today in Kolkata at the historic Bengal Chamber premises for a very special event, the fifth lecture in the Bengal Chamber Leadership Lecture Series. The Bengal Chamber, in continuation of its efforts to being relevant to trade, industry, and commerce, has traditionally been a forum for stalwarts to meet and share perspectives on growth and development issues. In keeping with this mission, the Chamber has always strived to bring to its stakeholders the vision and messages of thought leaders on key issues of economic and social importance in the country and the global order. With this in mind, the Chamber instituted the Leadership Lecture Series five years back, uh, no more than five years back, and uh, this is the fifth edition. 
with the sole objective of enabling our stakeholders to hear from legends on their perspectives on local as well as global issues. As I mentioned, this is the fifth edition of the special forum. And I'm delighted and privileged to announce our very imminent speaker for today, Mr. Sanjeev Sanyal. Presently, full-time member to the Economic Advisory Council to the Honorable Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi. Besides being an eminent economist and the author of seven books. Mr. Sanyal, ladies and gentlemen, needs no introduction. While he is a full-time member of the Economic Advisory Council to the Prime Minister, he was previously the principal economic advisor in the Ministry of Finance, Government of India since February 2017. And he has also represented India on a number of international forums. As the co-chair of the G20 Framework Working Group, he has been one of the main architects of G20's global plan, global action plan, to coordinate the global response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Before joining the government in February 2017, he spent over two decades in the financial sector and was global strategist and managing director at the Deutsche Bank. He was named the young global leader by the World Economic Forum in 2010. He's also a well-known economic theorist and writer. In 20, 2007, he was awarded the Eisenhower Fellowship for his work on urban dynamics. He has been a visiting scholar at Oxford University, a junk fellow at the Institute of Policy Studies, Singapore, a senior fellow of the Worldwide Fund for Nature, a fellow of the Royal Geographic Society, London, and an honorary professor of Jawaharlal Nehru University, Delhi. In 2015-16, he served in the Future City Subcommittee of the Singapore government, tasked with building a long-term vision for the city-state. We are truly in the presence of a renaissance genius. The current global scenario possesses highly uncertain elements. The recent pandemic has caused unprecedented, unprecedented human, humanitarian emergency and all of us face the pandemic with little knowledge and no experience. It caught our policymakers and government by surprise. Policymakers were unable to give clear indications as to what to do. At the same time, if you look at the current tensions related to the war on the eastern fringes of Europe, the whole global geopolitical dynamics has changed. With a number of sanctions being imposed on Russia, no country is able to forecast the impacts these sanctions are going to have in the international market for different goods and services in the near to long term future. If you recall our uh, recent budget was premised on oil at a price of $70 per barrel or something. And now we are talking about oil heading to levels of $170 per barrel in a space of a month. So one shudders to think, you know, the type of uncertainty that uh, governments are faced with, the type of uncertainty that businesses are faced with is really unprecedented. unprecedented. Amidst this backdrop, and with Mr. Sanyal present with us today in a session which I see has gathered tremendous enthusiasm among us all. I am sure you all are eager as I am to hear him speak on uncertainty and the art of policy making. May I now request Mr. Anup Hoom, Chairperson Marketing and Brand Committee, the Bengal Chamber, to set the tone for today's talk. What to you, Mr. Moon. Good afternoon, friends. On behalf of the Bengal Chamber of Commerce, and more particularly the Brand and Marketing Committee, uh, 
a very warm welcome to the fifth edition of our leadership series lectures. Uh, may I also uh, heartily welcome Mr. Sanjeev Sanyal for having taken out time, traveled to Calcutta, to our city, uh, and to enlighten us about the art of po policy making in uncertain times. I will also welcome our past president, Mr. Amrish Dasgupta, for being here with us to moderate, uh, to moderate the session. Uh, uncertainty, they say, is the only certainty. Uh, and what follows after that is that insecurity is the only insecurity, right? So we all know this phrase and we all talk about it. It resides somewhere at the back of the mind, more like a cliche. And we take a lot of things for granted. In the corporate world, each year when we do our annual plans or do a vision for three years, we try to do all kinds of sensitivity analysis. We see the risks and we think we've mastered it all. And then the Ides of March 2020 turned this whole world on its head. Little did anyone know what the future held. It was uncharted waters, absolutely unknown, a minefield. Behaviors changed, relationships changed, lifestyles changed, the economy changed. You just kept saying it, and it changed. That's it. And all of us found a lovely phrase which said, the new normal. Right? But what was this new novel? And while we all talked about it, uh, I really uh, fear to fathom what the policymaker went through. Right? And Mr. Sadyal, who was part of the G20 uh, group looking after uh, the COVID-19 response uh, on a global platform, I'm just trying to wonder the variables you dealt with, the models you, which you have worked with, and uh, you know, uh, the plethora of them, and each day, a new variable got thrown up, right? And you had to contend with it, right? Uh, uh, you could just not look at the economy, you had to look at people. You had, you had to look at livelihoods. Uh, and you had to save lives. You had to look at the healthcare sector. I can just carry on and on and on. So I think this session today is really going to teach us one thing, which is how to deal with uncertainty. And when you call it an art of policy making, yes, indeed, uh, there is this vision which you, as an economist, as a business person, uh, do have of the future. You try to build a vision which probably reduces the risk of uncertainty and make, makes you move into the realms of certain amount of certainty. Th thank you very much for being here. We're really eagerly looking forward to listening to you, sir, uh, and welcome. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Stefanos and Mr. Hoon. So against the backdrop that has been said, uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Sanjeev Sanyal and Mr. Omborish Dashkupto. Mr. Omborish Dashgupta, ladies and gentlemen, is senior partner in theory consulting and needs no introduction amongst those present with, uh, amidst us here today. A management consultant with more than 30 years of experience and a past president of the Bengal Chamber, Mr. Dasgupta was a member of the India leadership team in PwC and a national consulting leader in KPMG and a part of the leadership th team there as well. In his professional career, he has served global and multinational clients in India and abroad, advising C-level executives in the field of corporate and business strategy, global business and model innovation, business transformation, organizational strategy and governance, change management, and organizational dynamics. Currently, he's serving on the board of a few companies and also associated as an advisor with a lot of companies. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Sanyal and Mr. Dasgupta to the dais. Request Mr. Dashgupta to please take the first session forward. Thank you. May I request Mr. Sanyal to start by deli <coughs> delivering your talk? Good afternoon. Let me begin by thanking the organizers at the Bengal Chamber of Commerce for uh, inviting me to come here to this wonderful building uh, to deliver a talk um, at a time where obviously uh, I don't really need to 
um, explain to people the problem of uncertainty. Anybody who's lived through the last two years knows how uncertain the world can be. And, um, you know, I don't pretty much know anybody in the end of 2019 who would have predicted how the following two years were going to pan themselves out, even remotely being correct about what happened. And it's not over yet. So even as we speak, uh, events uh, in the other side of the planet, in, in the eastern fringes of Europe, um, have obviously taken a turn, which uh, has impacts all over the planet, including for us, uh, not the least through spiking up energy prices. So I don't have to explain to anyone the problem that the world is an uncertain and wobbly kind of place where all, all kinds of uh, unpredictable things happen. The question is, how does somebody take decisions in this environment? I as a policymaker, you as uh, business leaders, I can see there are a lot of students here. How do you make decisions about choosing a career? There's a lot of uncertainty even in that. So how do you make decisions when there is basically so much fog in front of you? You still have to take decisions, and <clears throat> many, and if you're specifically if you're in a, in a large country and a policy making for such a large country, uh, you know, you have to make trade-offs which will affect 1.35 billion people. So in that situation, how do you uh, sort of make up your mind to go left or right or center or whatever it is that the decision uh, that you have to make? So I hope to give you some flavor of that in the next 40 odd minutes. But before that, I'm going to try and use an analogy that I like using. And for that, I need some help from you. Let me see how many of you own a dog. Okay, so a lot of you own a dog. I can see quite a few. And I'm sure some of you have done the following thing or you've seen other people do this, so you'll be familiar with it even if you don't have a dog which is you take the dog to a park, you throw a frisbee, and the dog runs after the frisbee and catches the frisbee. Common enough phenomena, everybody here would have seen this happen. So the, now the question is, how does the dog catch the frisbee? Now, if you are a normal human being, you will throw the frisbee, the dog will run after it, catch it, and that will be the end of the matter. But if you are an economist, that is not what you will do. If you're an economist, you'll go to the park, you'll study the speed of the wind, then you will study the breed of the dog, then you will study the shape of the frisbee, the strength of your biceps, etc., etc., and you'll all feed this into a Excel sheet. Then you'll run several models around that Excel sheet, and after several iterations, uh, you will end up with a forecast. And so your forecast will say that the frisbee will go and land on so-and-so place. Now, if you happen to be a policymaker economist, not just any old economist, but a policymaker economist, you will take this forecast and you will submit it to the frisbee policy committee, who will then sit on it for several months, and after much deliberation between the joint secretary and the additional secretary, they'll give you the official forecast of where the frisbee will land. And then you take that official thing, you'll take your dog, you'll st put a stake in the ground, you'll tie your dog to that stake, then you'll go back and you'll throw the frisbee, and the frisbee will fly through the air and land 99% of the time somewhere other than where the forecast said it would land. Now at this point, the only person who would be surprised by this would be the economist. So the question is, how do non-economist dogs catch the frisbee? The way they catch the frisbee, and there is a lot of scientific research on this, you can go and look it up on the net, is the following. The owner broadly indicates the direction in which the frisbee is going to be th thrown. If you generally suddenly throw the frisbee, the dog won't know what to do. This is also true with the ball. You suddenly throw the ball, the dogs don't know how to follow it. But if you indicate the rough direction in which the ball will be thrown or the frisbee will be thrown, the dog will go and position itself in front, and then you throw the frisbee, the dog will run with the frisbee. 
It will look at the frisbee, run with the frisbee. Look at the frisbee, run with the frisbee. And then as the frisbee is coming down, it will lock in, jump and catch the frisbee. So what is the frisbee, what is the dog doing? Is the dog better at forecasting than the economist? No. The dog is not even attempting to forecast it. What the dog is doing, is doing high frequency feedback loop and adjust. Basically, it's looking at where the frisbee is going and it is adjusting quickly to what is actually happening. It is not sticking to any forecast. Now, now that you have got this analogy, now let me show you how we were making decisions over the last two years faced with this pandemic. Let us go back, exactly one year back, by the way, uh, two years back. <coughs> Early March, what do we know about this pandemic? Right? As policymakers, you're sitting <coughs> up on Raisina Hill and you hear that something bad has happened in China. You're getting all these WhatsApp messages of people walking around and collapsing and, you know, uh, the Chinese blocking of Wuhan, they're locking people into their houses. I'm sure you've seen all those WhatsApp messages. I don't want to tell you about it. But the Chinese are not telling you what exactly is going on. You have very little information for them. And the WHO is also very cagey about what's going on and not giving you clear impression. So you don't really know what, you know something's happening in China, but you don't know what's happening. You also know that whatever was happening in China has now spread to Northern Italy and it is suddenly also killing a lot of people there. That's also what you know. You don't know why they are dying. You don't know the nature of this uh, virus. You know nothing. So in, under these circumstances, like all responsible governments around the world, you call in the experts. So all the experts came and they made presentations to us <coughs> as they indeed did to many others. The problem was that all the epidemics experts and virologists, etc., who came and made presentations, they gave a very wide range of things that were going on. So there were people, and you, by the way, I don't have to tell you, you'll remember this from that time, it's not so long ago. There were some people who said, you know, this is just a very bad virus, uh, a, a very bad influenza. And then there were people who said, you know, millions of people will die as a result of this within the next three months, and, you know, etc., etc. So it was a very wide range of things that could possibly happen from saying that, you know, this is just a bad flu to millions of people just dropping dead as happened in the WhatsApp messages. So what do you do as a policymaker? Now, one option is that you look at the range of uh, forecasts that have been given to you. You choose which one you think is the most reliable because you like that particular expert and you think he's good, etc. And you go with that. And this is basically what some countries did. So that's how you got, for example, the Swedish model. Um, that's how, for initially, the UK opted for herd uh, immunity and then changed its mind. Singapore did something, changed its mind, and so on. So you opt for one of the other. Now the problem here in India is that we have 1.35 billion people. Whatever it is we decided to do, we are stuck with. You cannot change. This is a large oil tanker. If you choose to go with whichever one of these forecasts you happen to think it turns out to be wrong, you're in real trouble because you cannot change this direction in any way. So what do you then do? So we opted for something called a barbell strategy. Those of you who studied finance and derivatives in particular, you'll know what a barbell strategy is. Barbell strategy is a way of dealing with uncertainty by combining two opposite strategies. So rather than take the median strategy, which is what, say, the Swedish model is or something, you take the opposite, you take two opposite strategies and combine them. So in the case of <coughs> COVID, the application of this would be, you hedge for the very worst outcomes on one side, and on the other side, you do a Bayesian updating of information and make your way forward, like the dog catching the frisbee, you basically do a feedback loop and adjust and make your way into, into this fogginess that in, in the future. And this requires you to first of all have the view, which we did, that this is not a sprint, it is a marathon, and the only way you can deal with this marathon is by responding rather than trying to guess where this is going. So this is the context, incidentally, in which the first lockdown was done. It was hedging for the very worst outcome. 
It's not because we thought the very worst outcome will happen. We didn't know. It's just in case the most pessimistic guy was correct, then it is best to have done the full lockdown while we figure out what is going on. So that is the context in which the full lockdown was done. And let me tell you, as, <coughs> uh, as I was then the principal economic advisor to the government, we did not take this lightly. I mean, shutting down the whole economy for weeks on end is not something we took lightly. We were aware that it would cause very big economic cost. But we had to take the call that the human cost of something of that worst case scenario of turning up and literally millions of people, you know, dying on the streets was something that was too risky that we had to shut the whole thing down while we figured out what was going on. So the first shutdown was just so that we could create time to gather information, create some quarantining facilities, create some testing kits. Remember, none of these existed, PPE kits. And, you know, and this is when we finally figured out, okay, this is an airborne disease. So after a few weeks, we began to figure it out, not from our own experience, but what was going on in Europe, that first of all, it was clearly more dangerous to people who are older than those who are younger. Um, we knew that people with comorbidities, for example, were particularly vulnerable. By the way, none of this information existed in March when we took the lockdown. Now, as time passed, we got more information, we became more confident. So, step by step, we began to respond and open things up. So, by about September, the first wave spiked up. You will remember that. And then it came down. But by September, we had opened things up quite a lot. And we came in a lot of criticism saying, why did you lock up the place when there were only a few hundred cases? And you were willing to open things up when there are thousands of cases. The reason for it is not so surprising, now that you know. It's because we had a lot more information in September than we had in March. So six months of information allowed us to have some confidence to open things up that we know that it's you know, not, not so dangerous to people at least below 40. So at least the next, the younger generation is not going to be wiped out by this. Not a, not a trivial uh, you know, concern in the beginning. Um, we were able to figure out how to run lockdowns. We had some testing capability and so on. Now, the same logic was being utilized <coughs> for our economic response. Many other countries decided to go for these gigantic trillion dollar reinflation package type approach. And there was a lot, tremendous amount of pressure on us to do exactly the same thing. And by the way, it's a very attractive thing to do, to be, you know, knight in shining armor, make these grand announcements. But we figured that and this is somewhere where India was very different from any other country. We did not look on the COVID crisis as a, uh, a, a demand shock. Our view was if you're shutting down all the markets, this is not a demand shock. You shut down the system. People want to go to the, uh, the mall. They want to go to the restaurant. They buy, want to buy goods. They can't. So the real problem is it's a supply side shock because you shut down the supply. The, the, the channel through which the goods reach the consumer have been shut down. So there's a supply side. So simply adding large amounts of demand will only create inflation, something we have later discovered. So therefore, there's no point in pressing the, the uh, accelerator hard when you've got your foot on the brake. It will just overheat the engine. So we decided again to do the barbell strategy. So in the barbell strategy, what do you do? First of all, you hedge for the very worst outcomes. So what are the best worst outcomes? The very poor, literally running out of food or having enormous stress. So immediately we put in place something that's, I think, still in place or maybe being unwound right now. The world's largest food program, 800 million people were provided with food. We provided some small quantities of money to the very poor through the Jandhan system. Now, I know somebody will say, oh, but that is too small to reinflate the economy. Well, we are not attempting to reinflate the economy. We are providing a safety net. So that is the same thing. The same thing was being done, by the way, for the business sector. We suspended the insolvency and bankruptcy code. We injected enormous amounts of liquidity, as you will remember, into the banking system. Why were we doing this? What we do not want to happen is that a cascade of defaults caused payments crisis. So the 
So even good firms basically get jammed up because the whole system jams up from a payments crisis. So you can't pay him, he can't pay him, he can't pay me, I can't pay you. We all go bust because of this cascade of default. So you have to make the whole system keep it as super liquid as possible. So we put lots of liquidity in, cut interest rates. We also uh, made suspended the insolvency and bankruptcy code. We created all those guarantees, you will remember. So all of this is safety net approach. Just create a safety net on one side of the barbell. The other side of the barbell is step by step, look at what is happening in actually the data, not what our model said. Never mind what the model said. What is actually happening and respond to it as things happen. So this is the context in which every few months you will remember the Honorable Finance Minister would stand up and make a set of measures. And again, we came under some mocking from the media, etc. You know, we, we seem to having mini budgets every few months. Yes, in a situation of extreme uncertainty, when things are moving, the only thing you can do is watch the frisbee and respond. So that is why we were doing that throughout. Now, as we began by September 2020, opening things up, by October we had opened things up quite significantly, that is the context in which we began to ramp up demand in the system because things had opened, the supply side had been more or less opened up. And if you go back and look at the fiscal accounts, you will see huge amount of capital expenditure suddenly got pumped in and the economy did respond. So by March of 2021, the, that's exactly a year ago, you will remember despite that huge compression that had happened in, uh, in 2020, the economy had responded quite, quite sharply. Now, was there a possibility that another wave would come? It was always a possibility. Did we know that that particular delta wave was come, going to come and cause so much devastation in the second wave? No, it was a possibility, but we, we could not have guessed that it would be exactly that kind of devastation. But it did happen, and you know in April and May of last year, the second wave came. From a health perspective, devastating as many of you will have personally either uh, known somebody who do, or at least you would have witnessed within your wider circle the health impact of it. But on the economic side, we decided not to shut things down um, uh, 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 as had happened in the first round. Why? Again, the reason for that, even though Delta was a much more <coughs> virulent and dangerous strain than the first strain, the fact was we had a lot better information about it. We also kn knew that when you have this uh, pandemic going in different parts of the country at different times, the economic cost of shutting down the whole system for long periods of time was just too high. So what we did is we by and large let the states decide how much to shut down or not shut down and so on, which allowed at least those parts of the country which at that point in time were not badly infected to keep functioning so that some parts kept functioning while others were being shut down. We didn't shut the whole system down. Even the places that did shut down kept things running more or less better uh, than in the first round. So by now we had also had learned a lot about how to run lockdowns. People had changed their behaviors. They you know, worked from home, etc. had by this point become established. So the economic cost of the second wave was much, much smaller than in the first wave, even though the health cost of it was much higher. Now, this de decentralized approach, in my view, from an economic perspective, worked rather well. However, it doesn't mean that it worked for everything. We also had attempted at that time to allow for a decentralized vaccination program. That turned out, as it turned out to be, not a great idea. What happened is that all the states began to compete with each other for vaccine supplies and it caused a great amount of confusion. And so a few weeks later, this was again centralized and taken back. You will again remember this episode. And the vaccination program got on rail. I, I would argue that we have done a pretty good job given the sheer scale of this country in vaccinating this population. I'm quite certain pretty much everybody here above the age of 18 uh, has at least had one jab, if not two jabs. In fact, the older members in this audience would almost certainly have had two jabs. I have even had three jabs. So I would say we did a fantastic job on the vaccination program. But again, it required us to 
change our view midway. If we had gone there with the grand business plan and stuck with it irrespective of what the feedback was, it would have caused great amount of confusion. So the point I'm making to you throughout as you can see is we hedge for the very worst outcome and we are continuously adjusting to what is happening. So this is also true as we have now come through to the second half of 2021. Notice what we are doing. We are looking at this as extremely uncertain. So contrary to what many people kept advising us, we kept accumulating huge amounts of foreign exchange reserves. Right? We now have $635 billion of foreign exchange reserves. Almost $200 billion more than we had before the crisis. So people say, why are you accumulating all these foreign exchange reserves? Why, what we are doing is we are buffering, we are creating safety nets. Now you understand why we are doing this. Same thing is saying, why are you going out there and not spending all this windfall you're getting from good um, revenue growth? Notice in every stage we are building buffering. So when oil prices fell, other sources of revenue dried up, but we took the advantage of that and put a tax in and took in reserves. Many people may not have liked the idea that, you know, we were willing to put such high taxes to absorb this um, windfall, but it gave us fiscal flexibility. I mean, the debt to GDP ratio in India would have got spiraling up. I mean, of course it rose, no doubt about it, as it did in every other country in the world, but ours went up far less than, say, many other countries. So we actually have fiscal space today that we didn't, would not have had uh, uh, if we had imagined, uh, you know, attempting to simply go out there and spend the money and trying to. We have been fiscally responsible throughout. Even in this budget, you would have seen that we have very, very uh, conservative forecasts of um, what our revenues will be, how GDP growth will be, much more, for, much more um, conservative than the IMF, World Bank, uh, Moody's and all the others. Because we, we are strong believers that you have to retain a certain amount of buffer in the system. And so our fiscal deficit, for example, um, will be maintained at a good thing. This does not mean that we are unwilling to spend the money when the necessity is there, but you will see a certain amount of conservativeness which is inbuilt into our system because of this buffering on one side approach. On the other side, we are continuously doing feedback loops, right? One was when oil prices were very, very low. Remember, they fell to the range of 15. Now, today it's at 115. It's difficult to believe that barely 18 months ago it was at 15. So when it was at that, those 15, 20 kinds of levels, we took in the windfall. When by November of last year, it had gone up to 80, we reduced the taxes, so that buffer was there. Now we'll have to see what we can do because clearly prices have gone even further up. But I'm just giving you a flavor of how we respond to these situations. It is very important to understand that, <coughs> you know, do not try to max out the system. You have to have enough buffers in the system for uncertain situations. And this may require you to be somewhat uh, conservative in various ways. Uh, and and in not just in various ways, let me correct that, in a very specific way to be able to create some cushion and safety net for things going wrong or unintended consequences. And you have to be willing to continuously adjust to what actually happens, not what your theory says, not what your model says will happen. So let me now give you a flavor of how we would think about this whole thing looking into the future. In this context, I'll have to say that the post-COVID world is almost certainly not a reinflation of the pre-COVID world. This is the only thing we can know for certain. So the post-COVID world will have its own geopolitics. I don't think you need convincing of that anymore. It will have its own technologies. It will have its own consumer behavior, its own institutions, its own supply chains. All of these things will interact with each other in unpredictable ways. So anybody who's telling you that, you know, this is a new normal has completely got the wrong mental framework. 
There is no such thing as a new normal, never has been, never will be, as you pointed out earlier. There is no new normal. The world is a continuously evolving situation. If we may be living today in a particularly difficult time, but it's not, if I take you back 10 years back, what were you, you were just emerging out of the global financial crisis. Would you have said that that was a normal? If you went back another 10 years before that, you had had 9-11, you had just gone through the uh, dot-com bubble burst, you had just, just a few years earlier, you had had the Asian financial crisis. Was that the new normal? Or you went back another 10 years before that to the early 90s, you had had the Gulf War, the collapse of the Soviet Union, we ourselves went through major uh, economic reforms. Was that the new normal? The point I'm making is that there is no such thing as a normal. So, since there is, we have no way of knowing how the world is going to be over the next 10 years, the only thing I can tell you is that whatever is the case, we are not going back to the pre-COVID world. That's the only thing I can tell you for sure. Now, how do you then make policy for this post-COVID world? Well, same barbell strategy. You create some cushion on one side, and on the other side, you create flexible responses. So what does this mean in terms of policy making? Well, first of all, on one side, on the flexibility side, liberalize the economy, deregulate it, so that the private sector in particular can, can unleash the risk-taking, innovation, and other uh, sort of animal spirits so that they can go out there and take advantage of whatever it is this new world will do. There is no way that a committee of joint secretaries is going to figure out how this future is going to turn out to be. So, in fact, not even, you know, leading lights of the planning commission were ever able to do this. So, the fact is that the best thing we can do is to unleash the spirits, particularly of the young, since there are lots of young people at the back, to go out there and take risks. It's quite likely most of those efforts will fail. So what? Enough of them will succeed, enough of those innovations will work, that we will be able to innovate our way. So open those things up. And so even in the middle of all this chaos over the last two years, you will have seen we have kept going on reforms. We liberalized the drone sector. We opened up the uh, cartography and geospatial sector, the space sector was opened up. We removed all kinds of outdated telecom regulations on the BPO sector, if any of you have a BPO. Is anyone here who has a BPO or IT sector company? You'll know that there were these ridiculous telecom regulations that were there. Um, I don't know if you realize this, that the regulations till a year ago effectively meant that all the Google Maps that we were using on your phones was illegal because cartography was actually a monopoly of the Survey of India. It's only in June that it has been completely opened up. Um, you may not realize this, that till a year ago, um, working from home was also illegal, technically, because the telecom ministry had a notification that you had to have your own EPA-BX machine in, in the same facility wherever you are using a telecom line to do work. I don't know if you realize this. So, many of these kinds of irritants were just simply gotten rid of. So, th hundreds literally of small, small, small such uh, things are gotten rid of. Um, another thing, you know, uh, setting up a company was very, very difficult. We eased that over the last few years, but now, as you may have heard in the budget that the Honorable Finance Minister just announced, uh, we have also now begun to dramatically simplify the voluntary closure of companies and so on and so forth. So similarly, create, you know, uh, creating a framework for uh, indirect taxes, the GST. You may, may or may not like the ex you know, particular aspects of the GST, but the fact of the matter is, anybody who's done business in India will tell you that it is a dramatic improvement in whatever existed before. This may not be perfect, but whatever existed before was certainly a disaster with all those octroi and service taxes, and essentially nobody knew what was going on. I mean, we didn't in fact have a common market in India till essentially the creation of this, um, of, the insol uh, of the GST. Similarly, we finally have a framework for insolvency and bankruptcy. You, know, you can say that it is not perfect, fine, 
but at least the framework exists. Some very large companies have been taken through this liquidation process successfully. So all of this has meant that we now have a much more fluid system than was the case. The same fl flexibility now exists in our financial system. Despite two years of hammering, our banking system today is much better capitalized and much better positioned than it was before COVID. People may not believe this till they actually look at the numbers, but it is actually true. If we had gone through this crisis in 2015, I can tell you our banking system would have just gone bust or got jammed. But we have gone through this crisis. The banking system is actually better today than it was two years ago. That is really a testament to the huge amount of effort that the Reserve Bank and the bankers have gone th themselves gone through. Sometimes as businesses, you may have been at the wrong end, receiving end of all the tightening and cleaning and excess new rules, etc. But the fact of the matter is, in the end, the banking system today is much better capitalized, much better run, and is now in a position to expand, which it wasn't for many years, almost a decade it has not been in a position to expand. But now I can say that both our capital markets and our banking system is well capitalized, has enough resources to expand as and when the animal spirits of the financial, of the uh, private sector comes back. So first thing that I point I was making, we needed to create as much flexibility and we will keep doing reforms to deregulate, ease of doing business. You tell us the things you need done, we will pay attention to them. Where we can, we will remove those obstacles from your way. Obviously there are some things we need, corporate governance, environment and all those kinds of things, those have to be retained for good reason. But old bureaucratic rules that were there, we are systematically dismantling that. We are privatizing, we have, as I say, this government is not apologetic about privatization. We have done, obviously we have done Air India and a few others, we will do more. So that is one part of the bargain. But flexibility is not the only thing. The other side of the barbell is the problem of resilience. So it's all very good to have free markets, flexibility, etc. But the fact of the matter is you also have random shocks like the one we are going through now. So you need resilience to be the other side of the barbell. And in this context, I would like to explain the, the idea of Atman Nirbhar Bharat. Atman Nirbhar Bharat is translated as self-reliant India correctly. Unfortunately, it leaves you with the impression that this is some attempt to go back to pre-1991 Nehruvian socialism or some sort of a inward-looking import substitution of the 1950s and 60s or, or licenses and permits and so on. Absolutely not the case. I can assure you, <coughs> none of the policy makers in North Block or South Block for that matter have any intentions of going driving around in an ambassador car ever again. So this is not a return to the past. So what is the context in which we talk about Atmanirbhar Bharat? Atmanirbhar Bharat is about providing support and leveraging our indigenous capacities so that we can engage with the world. This is not a running back into the shell that we did before between 1950 and 1991. So, Rather than tell you this, let me illustrate the point so do you understand what I mean. You know that India is very, very competitive in the pharmaceuticals, particularly generics. So we have very competitive pharmaceutical sector. We are known to be the pharmacists to the world and so on and so forth. We are also big manufacturers of cars and we export lots of them. But during the course of the last two years, we have discovered that this pharmaceutical sector is completely dependent on certain inputs that very often come from single foreign sources. And I mean, even if it happens to come from a very friendly country, if it comes from one source that could suddenly switch off for whatever reason, then our entire pharmaceutical sector will be held hostage to this. The same thing is true with chips and our automotive sector. So what is the message that comes through? that no matter how efficient it may be to get it from this one source, there is a resilience angle to it that you need to pay attention to. And that may require you to provide a certain amount of support to be able to produce at least some amount of these 
uh, inputs into pharmaceuticals or cars or whatever it is, we, if we have a large industry which is dependent on these inputs, we have to provide a certain amount of capacity to make it in India. This is not an act of going back to socialist import substitution. This is a simply practical attempt to improve and strengthen the resilience of our globally competitive industry. If anything, this is strengthening our ability to deal with an uncertain world. We do not want to withdraw from the world. Our decision not to participate in RCEP is not based on somehow being against free trade agreements, far from it. We are pursuing some free trade agreements very aggressively, places like UAE with uh, Australia, uh, with the UK, in the longer run even with the EU and the US. So clearly we are not against free trade. We did not think that that particular, RCEP particularly, was in national interest. So we walked out from it. So it's not, it's not an ideological stand. It's a purely practical stand based on the pros and cons of that particular free trade agreement. But we do wish to engage with the world. We do want to trade with the world, but we will do it, one, in our own terms. Two, while being quite willing to intervene in my free markets, if necessary, to provide support for certain ingredients, inputs, and other uh, uh, sort of um, uh, uh, inputs that may be needed for the resilience of our industry. This will also be true of defense, where clearly, um, you know, we need to uh, build our own capacities, so we will again provide support. Another thing that has been historically true is that we have been, had a mental image that, you know, Indian industry is somehow making them global scale was somehow not kosher. The providing support to Indian industry to be of global scale uh, you know, was somehow supporting large industry and therefore somehow bad. That's not the case. If you want to compete with the rest of the world, you need to have global scale. And for that, we have specifically created something called the production lift incentives, the PLI schemes, as you will know. So PLI schemes are there to make those industries, we have identified a few, to make them big. Because only if you have truly global scale and we truly have global brands are we going to be able to create those guys who can go out there and compete. And then, of course, once you have these large companies that, they al that allows you to create the, um, uh, the supply chains of smaller companies that then feed into this larger company. So PLI schemes, again, you can see the thinking that is going behind this to, to intervene to create certain skills. We can't do it for every industry. We have done it for a set. We have told you what those are. It's there for a limited time. Those of you in this industry and you think you can scale up, please take advantage of it and scale up. Some of these hopefully will work. It's quite possible some will not. It's okay. We will then move on to another set of industries and do that again and so on and so forth into the future. Similarly, support will be provided for new industries like drones, for example, where a pro we have created a PLI scheme so that some capacity is built into a completely new sector. And in this context, again, let me say, we are particularly keen on getting new entrepreneurs to come in and invest, take risks, innovate. And startups is a very, very important part of that, um, of that initiative. Now, of course, one important part of what we are trying to do is not merely, you know, providing support of various kinds or the financial markets or whatever. Ultimately, risk taking is a culture. And that culture, unfortunately in India, for a long time was repressed. And so, that is something we are beginning to hopefully change. So, <coughs> uh, and, 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 and when one can see that, because as recently as a year ago, we did a map of where all the startups in India was. And it was quite obvious that most of the startups in India were in the obvious places, which was in and around Delhi, in and around Bangalore, some little bit in and around the Bombay-Pune corridor, and some drops here and there in Ahmedabad, in Hyderabad, in Chennai, and so on. That's basically was the limits of it. We did the same exercise in January with data from April to 
uh, December of 2021, and we discovered that there are some 555 districts in which there is at least one startup. And when, when I say startup, not just a new company, when I mean startup defined by DPIIT as, you know, having some innovation and so on, so a proper startup. So there are 555 districts where this is, this is happening. And you can see large blobs of areas and places where we hadn't expected this to happen. So of course, Delhi NCR is now the biggest hub. It, by the way, much to the irritation of friends in Bangalore, Delhi NCR is now the biggest hub of uh, startups in the country. Of course, Bangalore is the second biggest, uh, Bangalore, Mysore area. But there are other places as well. Um, you know, of course, the traditional Bombay, Pune area, but then places like Jaipur have become a um, major hub. Um, Lucknow is a major hub. Um, Kolkata has a hub, but I, I hope that it needs to really get its act together and buck up. I'm sure you can catch up with the rest. Uh, there is a lot of young people out there who I'm sure will get out there and uh, do it. And uh, I know this whole culture is changing because of course I give this similar kind of lectures uh, in uh, universities. And there's a real palpable change when I go to universities and make these kinds of lectures. So when I do, did it a few years ago, and I asked people, how many of you are want to set up your own thing, business or so on? You know, some people would raise their hands, typically from business families mostly, but by, by and large, that would be the limits of it. And then I would ask people, how many of you want to sit for the UPSC? And a lot of people would raise their hands. Now that t told me in those days, that we were still a rent-seeking culture. If you are a society where the talent wants to basically become deputy commissioner or something or the other, this is not a value-generating society. That has completely changed. You go to any IIT, go to SRCC, of course, was always very entrepreneurial, but if you go, I don't know how it is in Kolkata, but um, <clears throat> certainly most of the IITs I've been to in recent times, if you go and ask there, how many of you want to set up a startup I would say more than 50% would raise their hands to set up they want to do something. And they are. Many, many universities um, uh, ha now have startup uh, labs. Um, in fact, just yesterday night, I have a program on television called Economic Sutra, and the last episode was on startups. And the episode, one of the parts of the episode was of Gujarat University, which now has a startup lab. And you have all these university students doing all kinds of really cool stuff. Um, and so I think that is quite exciting. I mean, to see this kind of energy coming through from young people, um, trying to innovate, trying to uh, build value, uh, trying to take risk. So with that, let me stop, because basically my idea was to give you a flavor of how policymakers, but more generally societies, are able to deal with a world that is uncertain, unpredictable, and essentially foggy. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Sanyal. I think as expected, it was really very, very insightful. You gave us a very good insight on how in, a, in an event like COVID, how the plans have to be made flexible, how you have to have a very high frequency watch and keep on changing your plans accordingly. You also gave us an input on how to hedging against the risks that possibly at this point in time you cannot fully fathom, but we can have a futuristic uh, hedging against the, those risks. And most interestingly, that the post-COVID times also, what would be the future plans and the reforms and how we are even envisaging the Indian economy to progress, you touched upon it. So in the span of 40 minutes, I think you really touched upon a vast spectrum and it was extremely lucid and clear also. Now, as we are moving into the question answer session, so I will start with one or two questions and then uh, uh, request the audience to give the question. But see, I know you come from a very important position in the government and you have your own obligations and commitments also there. So therefore, I would rather not like to get into any of the discussion on the government policies, the pros and cons, or the positives or negatives of that, because we would not really like to make this platform as a debate on those things. And, but maybe some of the examples that I may give is not to really criticize those, but to just bring in a kind of my question. 
Now, the topic was on the uncertainty and the art of policy making. So my initial questions will be more on the postulates of how a policy making could be done. Now, in a COVID type of a situation, when there is a suddenness to the whole thing, when we were not expecting, then at that time, of course, the huge amount of the mass sympathy is with the policymaker because they, we also realize and feel that it's difficult for you to really understand which direction it's going, and therefore you have to keep on swiftly changing your plans. But in a very steady kind of a situation, when things are steady and there is no fortunately certain suddenness happening or some impulse coming in that way, when you are injecting a policy in that steady situation, just purely as an example, but not to criticize that, say demonetization. So in a very steady situation, you are injecting a policy change to bring in some levels of outcome. Now that may have a collateral outcome also. You have a certain outcome in mind, you may be achieving that and that may have some collateral outcomes as well. How do you really form your policy in such a steady situation injecting a policy, how do you test those hypotheses in a pilot mode? Yeah, yeah. How do you check that out, that whether it is going to achieve the outcome with a minimum amount of collateral damages to the various things? But I'm again saying demonetization here is just an example to bring out the postulates of the policy making in a steady situation. So, Hello. so demonetization is a particularly tricky one because of the need for, strict, uh, for secrecy. So it is not that, so in most cases where you have to do something, um, you will be able to signal ahead what you're going to do and be able, to, so, so it depends on what you're trying to do. So there are some things, for example, you can do a small test case. So there may be, say, if you want to do a you know, large scale uh, introduction of a particular scheme, let's say, you may be able to do a small case and then expand it. So you cannot do that with demonetization for obvious reasons. But there are many cases that you may be able to do a, a test case approach that works for some things. But I think the really tricky ones are things where you have to do one large thing in one shot because it cannot be done in bits. Because obviously if I could test out demonetization in one village and see what happens and that's great or I can test out uh, some other policy then, you know, then, then this debate is not an issue. The really tricky ones are when you have to do one big one. Now, I wasn't there during demonetization, so I can tell you about a later policy, which I did have something. Uh, I was there when it happened. I, mm -hmm. I was just joined, but at least I witnessed the, uh, the rollout of it. GST. Now, GST is a good example of a very large uh, policy that we had debated since when I was in college. So, the fact that we had this really dysfunctional indirect tax system was not unknown. We knew that in the early 90s, maybe even the 80s. And that some sort of a VAT type system had to be introduced was debated in you know, the Rangarajan committees of various uh, this thing. There was Kelkar had written about it and many, many others had talked about the need for a, some sort of a GST system to be introduced. So finally, in 2017, I think July or June and July it was then introduced. And there were a lot of complaints that, you know, it should have been better prepared and so on. Now, I, here I'm going to defer with that view and say that in fact, it is not possible to have introduced a perfect system when you introduce GST. You could broadly have a system because no matter when you introduced it, a lot of unintended consequences were going to happen. So the better thing to do was to take a reasonably functional framework, introduce it, and then fix it. So for example, the things that went wrong after GST introduction were not the things most people predicted would go wrong. But the things that did go wrong were things nobody imagined. For example, the correction button, if you entered something wrong here to correct it, that button didn't work. Now there's no way on earth, no amount of academic study would have told you that that was what was going to happen. The only way to do it is to do it and then fix it. So this is an example of how the dog can only run after the frisbee after the frisbee has been thrown. Now of course you don't want to randomly throw the frisbee in any direction, then nobody knows what's going on. 
But once you've got a broad direction, you've got to do it and fix it after the event. So this is an example of where a large scale project was done. Those who introduced it were aware that many things would go wrong, but they didn't know exactly what would go wrong. Now we could have debated forever. Another 20 years could have gone up creating this perfect system. But it was decided that, look, let's introduce it. It will not work for many months, but in the end, it will more or less work. And I can say that after so many years, yeah. now three, four years, it's a reasonably settled system. It's a dramatic improvement on whatever used to exist before. And I can say that my grandchildren will be using some version of this GST. I hope by then they have got rid of all the glitches. They have, you know, reduced the number of um, rates, etc. All the good things have been all been done. Great. But the basic framework of it will be exactly the same. And this is also true, by the way, of the insolvency and bankruptcy code. We could have debated it for the next 20 years, how to have the perfect insolvency and bankruptcy code, but we introduced it. We have made it work somewhat. There is no doubt that it is a dramatic improvement on the BIFR type system that we used to have before. Is it perfect? No. Can it be improved? Absolutely. But the BRAFIC framework is there and I am quite certain that even my great grandchildren will be using some version of this insolvency and bankruptcy code, hopefully with all the glitches ironed out. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you are an economist and a very eminent economist and a very, very eminent policymaker, absolutely at the helm of the affairs. Now, when in our corporates, when we actually try to get into the financial planning or the financial visioning, we usually call, there's a framework we call, we have been using in consulting, which is called a pastel framework, which is politics, economics, social, technology, environment, and legal and where we feel that the economics and the politics is extremely intertwined. So when you are making an economic policy out here, how much are you possibly, and not just you in a sense, you is a hypothetical, you I'm saying is a policymaker who comes from economics, will be more influenced or impacted by the politics of that country. And particularly in those countries where a government comes for a five-year term and they will be a little bit more myopic or, because, or they would rather like to elongate the existence of their government. So how much will be an economic policy be influenced by the political motivation? So I can't speak for others, I can speak from my own experience. Um, you know, I research a certain topic, we work out what should be done, and you know, I have had very, very good support from uh, the political leadership for doing difficult reforms, occasionally unpopular reforms, I can say this, that certainly this government, both the Honorable Prime Finance Minister and the Honorable uh, Prime Minister, have been very, very supportive for carrying out a lot of reforms. Uh, so I have personally had a very good experience. And this has been true during what has been extraordinarily difficult times. Mm -hmm. And so um, I would say, but for the fact that tough decisions were taken at various points in the last two years, sometimes unpopular decisions, and um, systematically and disciplined wise done. D disciplined point I'll make again. Even if you did the right thing, very often if you do it in a messy sort of way, very often it doesn't happen. But look, if you look at you know fiscal restraint, monetary restraint, um, you know systematic approach that we have taken to macro stability. Let me tell you that. That is paying us right now. I can assure you, given what we have gone through the last two years and the oil prices going up the way they have, uh, many, many emerging markets are going to be very, very, uh, in a very difficult situation. Even, forget emerging markets, even, even developed countries are going to face very difficult times. Have already faced and will face because many of them have run up huge debts. Uh, there are countries in our neighborhood, which I will not name, but some of them, uh, several of them, uh, are now at the brink. So the fact that we have run this with a steady hand uh, is means that you know I can come here and have this discussion in relatively uh, calm environment. I can tell you there are countries, uh, emerging markets in this in the world, which with these oil prices will be in you know uh, really be pushed over the edge. Yeah. I'll have two more questions before I pass on to the audience. You mentioned about the Atmanirbhar Bharat, and of course connected to that is our Make in India policy. 
where of course there are a lot of fiscal stimulus is being provided by the economists as a policy maker and of course uh, it's a lot of encouragement being given but my question is more on the interconnection of various policies as an economist as a policy maker you are giving as much as fiscal stimulus is possible for you to provide the make in india environment but even if we pump in a lot of money or we give him a lot of uh, kind of uh, relaxations and uh, <clears throat> waivers to the various people getting into it, do we still feel that technologically, educationally, skill-wise, we are capable to produce a Tesla car here in India? So therefore, our educational policy, the quality of the engineers we produce, the quality of the designers we produce, the quality of the scientists that we produce from the colleges, universities, schools. So that comes under the education policy and there. How are these policies therefore getting connected and giving us a holistic so, policy? So, absolutely capable. After all, half of these things in America are done by our own IIT graduates. The same chaps go there and do it. So, it is not a great difficulty. And I have an idiosyncratic view on this matter, by the way, which may be interesting to industry. I am a believer that while education is provides some inputs uh, towards the workforce, it is neither, uh, it is not sufficient, it may not even be necessary. Let me explain this because it may, some people may find this little odd. Mm -hmm. Most of the rapid expansion of China happened with workforce which is no better than the one we have today. Go back and look at China's education qualifications and other things in the late 90s, early 2000s. They were not better than ours, perhaps worse. It is in the building of uh, the industry that these skills were created. After all, what free uh, set advantage does Haryana have in manufacturing cars? It's nothing, it's just that the factory came up there because of a variety of reasons. So therefore, Haryana became one of the preeminent places where skills in automation, automotive industry built up. Um, and then because a town came up there, it now has become India's, I'm sorry Bangalore, but it is now India's startup hub for high tech stuff. And Noida, I mean, nobody thinks UP is the center of a lot of startup activity, but it is. Noida is one of the chief hubs of startup industry. So the point I'm making is I'm not a great believer that every piece of every piece of the puzzle has to be in place and then the next step will happen. The whole point of my talk, the philosophical basis of it is that you cannot have a mechanical view. Economies are not machines where you need all the pieces and then you put them in and then you plan it and build it. Economy is not a machine, economy is an ecosystem. It needs to be tended to but very often once you've got it to some going and the, it, it sort of breeds on itself. And so, once the investment, a lot of this will come, once the investment comes, it creates its own skills, it brings its own um, entrepreneurship, its own uh, zing. After all, what are education systems in a rapidly changing environment are always behind the curve, not ahead of the curve. I'm sorry, most of the jobs of the next 10 years are not known to academics. So, you know, the entire social media field was created by Zuckerberg. He didn't even bother to finish his undergraduate degree. So let's not get caught up with this, you know, idea that, oh, our university curriculum will change and then this university comes. No. It's good if the, if the universities catch up, great. But frankly, we've got to free up our minds and begin to invest in things that our universities may not be. So the real thing our university should be teaching is not specific skill, but the ability to learn. And that is what really we need to do. Then apprenticeships by Indian, uh, Indian industry and commerce is far more important to create the skills and ultimately even more important than that is the real sort of buzz amongst our youths. And why youth? Even old people like us. Uh, to take new skills, take new risks. And my last is in terms of the policy formulation when you are into it, manufacturing or economic, how much do you involve the diverse spectrum of people beyond the 
beyond the government's policy makers or some academicians, like the private participation, the car corporates, the CEOs, the manufacturing people, the startups, the MSMEs, I mean, do you really involve them also? Yes, we do. Um, there are consultations. A lot of effort, at least is by this government, is being made. You will see a lot of the policy makers, in, not so long ago, consultation meant that whoever was the person called his batchmates had chai and that was the end of the consultation. That's no longer the case. Most of these policies are now put up for public con uh, consultation on the website. This is done with laws, with policies. I have personally done this with many things. Uh, go out to industry and ask them for inputs. And then the policy is made. Even after that, by the way, if it turns out to be not good enough, the policies are changed. And I'll give you one example of this happened just last year. The drones policy was needed a drone's policy was put together by the civ uh, Civil uh, Aviation Ministry. It was announced and this was came, it came together after consultations with industry, this civil aviation, it came up with policies. But after the policy was announced in June, I think, for whatever reason, industry came back with the feedback that it was not, it was just too restrictive and too complicated. So, few months later, the drone policy was radically reviewed. So just within four months of the old policy, the government itself came back with a new policy with feedback and changed it. That's the point about this feedback loop point I'm making. Just because some wise people in, in Niti Aayog think that something is good, doesn't mean it's good. If it turns out it's not good, we should change it. May I now go to cr cross over to the floor? Please. Mr. Jatke, please. You have a microphone here? Sir, my name is Timit Chatterjee. I'm the chairman of the indirect tax committee of the chamber. I have two small questions. India's tax GDP ratio is only 10.4 percent today. Tax GDP ratio is about 10.4 percent against uh, expected around 15 percent world average. If you take it. The basic reason for that, that we have kept a significant portion of our economy outside the tax bracket. And out of six crores or 6.5 crores return filing, income tax return filing, only one crore 50 lakhs people pay income tax. Balanced people file income tax return for refund or for compliances. That means in a country of 135 crores people, only 1 crore 50 lakhs pay income tax. In this situation, what is your, as a policy maker, particularly in the economic uh, policy area, how do you expect the country's tax GDP ratio will increase? We earn only 22 lakh crores in terms of revenue, in terms of tax. It's a very, it's too small. Yeah, sure. As this is obviously a, 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 a debate that is regularly had in my time in finance ministry. And <clears throat> first of all, the ratio is higher now than that 10% that you mentioned. Uh, tax revenues are growing much, much faster than GDP now, last two years. So, uh, and ironically happening during the time that the economy went through a downturn, the tax, to tax collections have dramatically gone up. Ideally, what you want in, for a country like India or any country is to have very low tax rates and everybody, no exemptions and everybody pays some tax. So, what you don't want, and I'm not in favor of uh, European tax rates at all, it causes all kinds of problems. So, ideally, you want low tax rates, no exemptions, and as simple as possible. And the more complicated the country, the simpler the tax system should be. So, Again, many people will tell you, oh, you want Singapore type tax system, but you know, Singapore is a small country. No. The larger the country, the simpler it should be because the more complex the situation, the more, sim the more chances of it going wrong. So therefore, India needs the simplest possible tax system. One step towards that was GST. We removed plethora of taxes. Maybe the tax system is still more complicated than ideal, but it is dramatically simpler than what used to exist. Over time, it should be simplified further. Obviously, a lot of that depends not on the central government, but on the state governments who have most of the uh, 
uh, votes on the GST council. So, but over time, the GST system should move towards a much sim even simpler system. Anyway, but your main point was on direct taxes <clears throat> and I would argue that even in that case, uh, the idea is to have the simplest possible tax system because the most important way to increase tax collections is to make it easy and simple to understand how much is a person supposed to pay. Now, of course, in a poor country like India, a very significant proportion for the time being is not going to pay taxes. It doesn't, so, you know, don't compare this one crore with 130 crores. That's not a meaningful, first of all, it's not even meaningful to look at it that way because remember, it's individuals are paying taxes, but they are representing families. So, a family, when you take a much larger pool of people are paying taxes. But anyway, it is, it should be a larger number, no doubt about it. And it helps that we are simplifying it. We are doing a huge amount of uh, digitization. Uh, the GST itself by gathering huge amount of information is providing us with better information. And all of this is feeding through to the fact that compliance is improving. There is no doubt uh, that compliance today is radically better f than it was five years ago. Now whether, now, whether that is because of any particular step, no. It is the accumulation of many different small steps. Even demonetization had some role in it. The GST and now IGST data has some role in it. Uh, di uh, simplification has some role in it. We should further simplify the direct taxes and so on and so forth. And the idea is that over time, what you end up with is a very simple system, very transparent, that will basically become buoyant along with the economy. The steps that we have taken in that direction have already borne fruit. The fact that we dramatically lowered, for example, corporate taxes has borne fruit. Even during very tough times, corporate tax collections have gone, gone up. Uh, you know, suggesting that the Laffer curve works. At least in India, it works. So I think same thing should be broadly done with other taxes as well. Uh, yes, there is a question from the back first. Let me go to Good afternoon, Professor Sanyal. So it was a pleasure hearing uh, you. So I am uh, Professor Shomujit Roy from IICR Kolkata. I am a scientist and also a startup co-founder that brings me here. So now I am also an ex-IITN. Now, one of the points that you mentioned, which, uh, which br uh, promotes me or provokes me to ask this question, is a cultural one, how we can be resilient towards failure, because fa acceptance to failure in the society like Bengal or India is rather low if we compare it to the US. Now, how we do that, this first question, in terms of policy making decision, number two is science, as you know, needs time to deliver. The deliverables, the time scales of deliverables of deep innovation or deep science is 10 to 15 years. But we have a mandate for the government, for instance, to deliver within five years. So how you can, you can build in a science motivated policy that can come up with deliverables within five years, but also can create an environment for deep innovation that will deliver in long run for the country. And in order to do that, how you envisage that failures can also be built in, the tolerance to failure can be built in, in the mindset, especially of the young people. Thank you very much. Tricky question, because there's no one way of investing in a culture. In the end, this is a broader thing. It's not for governments, but broader society to build that culture. So it's not like, you know, there is a uh, tolerance of Failure Act that then we passed and then everybody becomes more tolerant of failure. But yes, government can put in place policies that allow for it. The Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code is a very good example of it, that you allow for companies to go bankrupt and it's no big deal. You, you know, companies, rather than uh, keeping these companies alive forever in some warehouse called the BIFR, we now are, don't have any problems about taking very large companies, you know, just in the last few years, look at the huge companies that have gone bankrupt and have not been rescued, so to speak, Jet Airways, uh, SRs, uh, and many other very large companies. So I think 
as a country, we certainly have become much more tolerant of failure uh, and allowing for this to happen. For example, Jet Airways, uh, Jet Airways shutting down has, has it, or Kingfisher for that matter before that, has in no way deterred now even further new uh, players entering the uh, airline industry. So what I'm saying is that I think this change is happening. Um, government can play a role. But this is something that we need as a society to invest in. It's not everything needs to be done by government. In fact, it might be an oxymoron to ask the government to invest in innovation. This is something that society more broadly needs to do. Now, as far as specifically about science and investing, well, one of them ultimately has to be that you have to create two things. One is create autonomy within institutions that do invest in science and deep science like the IITs or CSI, CSIR and so on. Give them resources to do investment, some of it will go wrong, it's okay. We cannot have bureaucratic uh, expectations that this particular experiment will actually be successful. So that has to be done, but I think in the end, given India's framework, much of this will have to be done by the private sector. And so we really need to open things up so that the private sector can do these innovations. Incidentally, much of the innovation happens in America also by the private sector. Uh, you know, even NASA, which is a top-notch institution, has now been um, overtaken by SpaceX, even in a sector like space. Uh, this also makes me curious to ask one more question is, uh, does any country in the world have a policy, not just India, to really take stock of the failed policies, lessons learned from the failed policies, and even to make that public, so that people also know that these were the failed policies of the government and what lessons did we learn? Yes, and this is something where historians and academics have a role to record the follies of the past. Unfortunately, in India in particular, the academics are so invested into the follies that they don't like to talk about it. This is one of the reasons why we need to actually rewrite and re-narrate our history. So, because academia is so heavily taken over by left-leaning thinking, they simply fail to convey this story of failed policies. And that's why a younger generation co keeps coming back and parroting ideas that have clearly failed in the past. And it is embedded in the narrative. I'll give you an example. You'll hear people using the word Hindu rate of growth, right? This relates to the first three decades of low rates of growth during the socialist period. Now, the impression you get from hearing the Hindu rate of growth is there something to do with Hinduism? It doesn't. It has everything to do with Nehruvian, bad Nehruvian policies. But the impression you'll get from this is that somehow Nehru did not fail India, but India failed Nehru. So this is the narrative telling that is a problem and that has to be changed. And by the way, I'm here back on 12th in Kolkata to participate in a debate on whether or not the Narrative, historical narrative India needs to be retold. To be re retold. Yes. Yeah, I think there was a. Yeah. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. I am Abhijit. I would like to know that uh, government of India is aiming to take the country's GDP to five trillion dollars in next two three years. Currently, we are at around three trillion dollars. So, is it possible? And what actually we are doing to achieve it? So, obviously, that five trillion target was placed at a time before the COVID crisis, and we've gone through two years of uh, COVID. Obviously, there will be some impact and delay because of it. But I think it will, it's difficult to put numbers to it, but I do think that that delay will not be as much as people fear. Maybe 18 months or something like that from the original target. But I think, I would argue our economy has actually survived this COVID crisis rather well. Um, our macroeconomically, we are stable. We have, uh, as I said, foreign exchange reserves are high. Our exports are growing very well. Um, inflation, of course, now oil prices is putting some pressure on it, but other than that, it's been well contained. Uh, the banks are in good shape. Uh, in fact, if we get a 
sort of a highway, a clear highway for a little period, uh, then I can tell you that this economy is capable of growing at 8-9% for several years. We obviously need some clear highway, but the accelerator can be pressed. So we have the resources and the, you know, whether it's the fiscal resources, and even if you look at the sheer amount of entrepreneurial energy that's bubbling, we just need the clear highway, and this economy can really ramp up. Um, and as I said, the IMF itself expects us to be the fastest growing economy, not only this year, but next year also. But we in the in economic survey provided somewhat more conservative numbers, but even those conservative numbers would quite easily make us the fastest growing economy in the world. So we can do it. But this withdrawal of this agricultural bill can affect the growth to some extent? No, I mean, it, in the very long run, it causes, uh, I mean, the, the issue about agricultural marketing, etc., is a long thing. But do remember that agriculture is now a much smaller part of our economy. It, it does have implications for that sector, but the bulk of the economy is now services and manufacturing. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon. This is Shomnath Chakraborty representing Narula Institute of Technology of JS Group. I have twofold questions, especially first of, first of all, um, among the two side of forces, the supply-led factors and the demand-led factors. So of course we have seen that uh, there is a emphasis first of all during the lockdown period, first on the supply-led factors. But how far over the time that? Uh, how important uh, has become the demand led factors and if I ask whether uh, how far the demand led factors uh, will be uh, more important to jack up the effective demand in the economy and second there is a research by the IIT team if uh, we are all incorrigible optimists of course uh, that if the fourth wave at all attacks will you think that the bubble model which you discussed in detail on today so will the policymakers will run on this model to revive the economy? Thank you. So first of all, one of the points about my talk is that I'm not a great believer in these predictive models. These mechanical models are unable to take care of a complex, I'm a complexity theory, chaos theory man, so you'll never be able to convince me that these predictive models have any value at all. Models are useful merely to provide scenarios and particularly to guess worst case scenarios for hedging. I am totally not a believer in the ability, human ability to predict particularly the future. So that's the crux of my talk was how to take decisions when you do not know. So that is the first point. Now as far as demand and supply is concerned, well they are not meaningfully thought about separately from each other. If you dramatically increase demand without increasing supply, you get inflation. That's what we are already facing. So. You know, this idea that you can think of one without thinking of the other is meaningless. In particular, those who have been brought up in Indian uh, economics departments tend to be only remember their macroeconomic class where they learned the Keynesian demand equation and forget to read the Hayekian side of the, of the uh, thing which is not taught hardly enough. Hayek is almost not taught in India. So the supply side is happily left uh, and never taught. But the fact is it's not meaningful to think of the supply si uh, demand side without the de um, uh, supply side. If you do not invest in your supply side and you increase demand, you just get inflation. It does not, doesn't require genius to know this. Unfortunately, most economists around the world uh, seem to have been caught up in this uh, idea. And I remember during the 2020 and 21, I was warning people that please do not keep pressing the accelerator your foot is on the brake, it will overheat the engine. And I wrote, and, and, and Nobel laureate Stiglitz came and gave a long lecture on what India should do, including ideas of helicopter money and all this. It would have been a disaster if we had done this. We would have had inflation, the system would have spiraled up, we would have lost control on the macroeconomic side, and it would have been a real problem. Thank God we did not follow that. The point is, you have to remember the supply side if you want to do demand side, and the relationship between the two is the game. I think he has to take a flight, Mr. Sanyal will have to go back, he has to take a flight. I don't think we really have the luxury of asking more questions. 
can you have a discussion with him because he will be with us during the lunch time also yeah. so you can have a one on one question with him so i would really now want bengal chamber to come in and thank but personally i'm very very touched by the very frank discussion mr sanyal you did i can fully understand the difficult situation you were in but your wisdom and also the practicalities of the problems in hand that was so well blended together in your presentation which the real art of a policy maker i'm really touched by the such an insightful talk thank you so much mr sanyal thank you so much mr dashgupta uh, we would now request dr shubhorno bos chairperson of the hospitality committee of the bengal chamber to please come up and deliver the vote of thanks Uh, good afternoon ladies and gentlemen friends and uh, on behalf of the bengal chamber of commerce and industry my heartfelt sincere thanks to mr sanjeev sanyal for being with us uh, amareshda for being here it has been an absolutely fascinating one hour you promised 40 minutes but we got a little more slice from you and we loved every every moment uh, i have heard all the uh leadership talk before and this must be one of the best and uh, the way the you have explained the complexity really really uh made it very clear for us when you said that you are an economist who try to make solution out of complexity we now understand that and especially especially thank because you are a person from bengal from calcutta and that is i think a big big take for all of us at bengal chamber of commerce so thank you very much for being with us and uh, uh, thank you i have to just read the book um, names from my mobile I'd like to express my most sincere most thank on behalf of bengal chamber of commerce to the jis group the telegraph who is our media partner the excite industrial limited the tata steel century ply tata steel downstream products limited TCN Global and Response India, our creative partners for the program, along with uh, Six Balinese Place, of course, the good food, and Selvel India for extending their support for making this even such a great success. Uh, thank you all. Now, may I also please request on stage uh, Mr. Taranjit Singh, Managing Director, GIS Group, to please come up. on stage and hand over a moment to to mr sanyal on behalf of the bengal chamber of commerce and industry mr taranjit singh please thank you sir that's mr taranjit singh going to present a lovely moment to to mr sanjeev sanyal can i have a big round of applause please ladies and gentlemen I hope you like this oh, yeah. portrait. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much. So you need, you need some extra bubble packs now. Yes, I do. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we'll organize that for you. Thank you. I'm looking younger actually than. <laughs> now, may I also um take this opportunity to request our beloved president Mr. Abraham Stefanos to come and please hand over a moment to to mr ambarish uh, das gupta thank you well done and thank you all of you for being with us on this very iconic leadership talk thanks for all the support and we hope to see all of you for the lunch at the bengal lunch bengal lounge in the, in the third floor thank you and that's me subarna bo signing off thank you so much thank you uh, just one more pleasant task to be performed we request uh, the president to please come up on the dais and hand over another memento that is there for mr sanyal please
Ya. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank Mr. Sanya and Mr. Dasgupta for a riveting session today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all, and please do join us for lunch on the third floor. Thank you. <laughs>